feel awesome. I feel awesome because uh, that was a fight that I, you know, I thought it was, I think it was exciting. Especially for me. Freedom! Freedom! Could be heard from miles away as Marcin Tabora chanted on his way back to the locker room after defeating Tai Tuivasa, becoming the first NPC Apex heavyweight to ever win a fight against a real, like, dangerous KO power heavyweight. Marcin Tabora earned his freedom tonight, and it is shocking. Many have tried. Martin Budai was the most recent. Unfortunately, he fought the blob. Josh Parisian went up against Robelis to Spain, tried to impose his will like a madman, and lost. Marcin Tabora is the first NPC heavyweight to ever make it out the apex. I think he's flying to Poland tonight. They've taken the battery out of him. He's no longer going to be walking out off of a conveyor belt. We've seen guys try to break out of the apex a couple years ago when the UFC needed more heavyweights. In 2020, the promotion shut down. They needed more fighters on the roster. They created the NPC heavyweights. They created the battery packs. They marched them down on the conveyor belt. We've seen guys like Justin, who else is an NPC heavyweight? <laughs> it's just beautiful. Submitting Tai to Ivasa, imposing his will like a madman, earning his consciousness, and defeating Tai to Ivasa, the Western Sydney banger, with all the personality that he has, all the KO power that he has. Unfortunately for Tai to Ivasa, let's actually break this down before we get into the other fights. Let's actually get real, okay? Tai to Ivasa just lost to Marcin Tabora, who before tonight was. A guy that I was calling Big Tubby. Okay? I'll never call him Big Tubby again. Of course. All respect to the man. He's flying to Poland. I hope he has a great flight. Tied to Ivasa lost to Marcin Tabora tonight because he was being reckless. We know that Marcin Tabora is decent on the ground. His way to win this fight was always going to be survive the early onslaught, close the distance, get your hands on him, take him down, and try to beat him up on the mat. I think that Tai Tuivasa could have done a much better job than he did tonight. What I saw tonight was carelessness, recklessness, and just overall stupidity from Tai Tuivasa. I mean, what was this guy doing? Closing the distance with naked tomahawk elbows at heavyweight? He was literally fighting like he was MVP, or he thought he was MVP. You're a heavyweight. You're like 265 pounds. You ain't got no hops. Literally, no right hands. There were some right hands, to be fair. But this dude was literally jumping in with elbows, trying to swat at Marcin Tabora. Like, you are not John Jones. You do not have a long reach. Okay, what are you doing? No patience, just gun ho run at him and try to blitzkrieg him out of there. And that works sometimes. Taito Ivasa was imposing his will, but he was doing it in the most unintelligent way possible. If Taito Ivasa had went out there and just sat at kicking range and chucked big, nasty calf kicks at Marcin Tabora, who, even though he's built like your typical apex heavyweight, has the lower body of a welterweight. It's very weird. Marcin Tabora has these like shredded legs, but this fat upper body. If he had just went out there and thrown nasty calf kicks at kicking range against Marcin Tabora, if he had landed at least 10 of them, he would have had a much easier time knocking his ass out if you took the base away first. But no, he didn't do that. He didn't try to sit behind one twos. He didn't try to wait for Marcin Tabora to overextend on something. He didn't even just try to box them. He went in there running at him with tomahawk style elbows, just darting in with jumping elbows. Like it's just a stupid game plan from him. And as soon as it hit the mat, now Ty really did try to stuff that takedown, but Marcin Tabora with all the heart that he had tonight, I mean, really, all the heart that Marcin had tonight. He was not going to be denied. Marcin DeBoer earned it. And I respect that a lot. But Tai Tuivasa put up a good fight, stuffing that first takedown. He gets taken down. No defense on the ground at all. No ability to stop Marcin from taking his back. Marcin cut through whatever defense he had, took his back, started pounding on him, whooping his ass. And even though they're... Not the heaviest shots. There's still shots from a heavyweight apex fighter. 
that's still a guy that's 240 pounds landing big thudding blows. And Marcin Tabora gets that choke locked in about two minutes before the fight ends. And I think that Tai Tuivasa's toughing it out, right? You could see his eyes kind of glazing over at some point as well. But he was there. If you look at his facial expression, he was trying his hardest to tuck his chin to fight out of it. And I was thinking, dude, there's no way Tai Tuivasa's going to tap to this. Like, I see he's putting in a lot of effort to tuck his chin, even though his eyes are starting to glaze over. He's doing everything in his power not to get submitted here. Marcin Tabora loosens up on his grip a little bit. And it looks like Tai Tuivasa's in the clear. 30 seconds later, Marcin Tabora gets the grip back again. And I didn't even see what exactly happened when it came to the finish. Did he tap? Did he go to sleep? The ref just stepped in. I still don't know. I'm going to have to rewatch the finish. Like, someone remind me in, in the comments. Either way, he either went to sleep or he tapped. But, yeah. The credit to Marcin Tabora. A horrible performance from Tai Tuivasa. Like, actually dog shit performance. And I think he could have done a lot better with a different game plan. If he was just a little bit more patient, and I know I always give heavyweights credit for imposing their will and, and fighting like a madman and all that, but it's like Tai Tuivasa has so much power in his hands. He has great calf kicks. You don't have to fight like a fool. You could have been a little bit more patient and just chucked a bunch of calf kicks at this guy, slowed him down, waited for him to overextend on something, trusted in the fact that you had the power advantage. Horrible performance from Tai Tuivasa, but you know what? Credit to Marcin Tabora. He looked incredibly grateful to win this one, to earn his freedom. And I'm going to show you guys my reaction to the finish. Oh my goodness. Tubby man might get his freedom. No, he's not going to go out. Ty is toughing it out. Ty is toughing it out. You could see him. You could see him. He's toughing it. Oh, he's smiling. Ty's smiling. He's smiling. He's good. He's good. <laughs> Ty is smiling. He's ready to go. Ty doesn't want to get sent to the apex. So this is this is fortitude. This is grit. Oh! Oh! Marcin Tabora earns his freedom against Tai Tuivasa. Holy crap. Whoa. Marcin Tabora earns his freedom. He's done. He's done with the Apex. Holy crap. He's literally a real person now. That makes it, honestly, I might want to shed a tear. That's crazy. This was the night of the upsets. It was the night of the upsets. Jose Aldo was booked to fight. Jonathan Martinez, I am going to be breaking that down at the end of this video. So check the timestamps in the description if you want to hear my take on that. But anyway, let's just get on to the co-main event. Brian Battle, Angelusa. I'm just going to call him Lusa. He pussied out in this fight, okay? Brian Battle was whooping his ass in the first round, doing really well. Angelusa is the definition of a tough out. He's basically just a, a, a mid fighter. There's nothing that he does that's excellent. He has durability. That's basically it. And he's just game. He's a game opponent with good durability. Does he have great kicks? No, not really. Does he have phenomenal power? I mean, it's nothing extraordinary. Does he have good toughness? Yeah, he's a tough out. Okay, he's basically like the Pedro Munoz of unranked welterweights. And anyway, second round, Angelusa headbutts Brian Battle. Nasty headbutt. Volkanovsky style of headbutt. Ducking under and then coming up with a big head of his. And then Brian Battle eye pokes him off of the break. The referee calls timeout. I'm thinking it's for the headbutt. I'm like, oh shit, the headbutt. Like, that's crazy. And then I see Angelusa complaining about his eye. The eye poke, it was a real eye poke. It didn't look that bad. And instead of the doctors telling him, listen, you got five minutes. I know you might not be good right now. You got five minutes. We're going to wait the timer out. They call the fight. As soon as Angelusa says, I can't see, they call the fight. First of all, Angelusa talking a whole load of smack after the fact, as if he wanted to stay in there, even though he had five minutes, like everyone does when there's a timeout and a lull on the action due to a foul, talking a lot of smack against Brian Battle, as if he's, you know, trying to be Mr. Tough Guy again, even though he clearly wanted out. He has no business to do that, and I'm happy that Brian Battle called him out on the mic. And he's ready to turn this around next week. I say put it on next week's card because next week's card is atrocious. But we need to get serious about this. I'm tired of timeouts being cut short when there's a five-minute window. The same thing happened on the Abu Dhabi card with Johnny Walker after he got kneed by Magomed and Kalayev. They didn't even wait past a minute for that one. 
The same thing here. They waited about a minute and 20 seconds. That was kind of it. All right, what, what's the point of having the five-minute timer anyway? You can't let someone screw up a fight like this. You have to at least let it play out a little bit more. So I hated that. Let's get on to the next one. Kennedy Nizitrekwu and OSP. OSP, this was not the usual washed up old OSP that looks uninspired, looks like he doesn't want to be there, throwing five punches and a couple of kicks per round. This was a hungry, fire lit under him OSP that was moving forward like a warrior the whole time with tons of output, gritty boxing in the clinch, actually trying to win a fight. And he beats Kennedy Nizatruku. Now, let's not act like Kennedy Nizatruku just got fraud checked. He's been beat a bunch of times before this. But I think most people would have expected a big, powerful, light heavyweight like Kennedy to be able to knock out an old OSP who has been finished multiple times in his career. I think his last fight he got finished. OSP's been getting put away by guys that aren't even that dangerous. Let me just look up OSP's record really quick. He got knocked out by Felipe Linz in this last outing, which is like an ex-heavyweight. That's not the worst guy to get KO'd by, but... I mean, OSP looked terrible in that fight. Had a split decision versus Shogun Rua? KO'd by Tanner Boser? Are you kidding me? Knocked out by the bum Jamal Hill? I'm kidding. Well, Jamal Hill's no slouch. There's that. But, like, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is... Throughout the past couple of years, OSP has always struck me as a guy that just doesn't want to be there. He fights like he's half asleep. He never looks excited at all. You know what I mean? He just has no energy. And he does. He fights like it too, throwing a couple punches around. He had the grittiest performance of his whole career tonight. All right. We've seen him have a couple of slugfests here and there. But tonight, man, this was like an Andre Barriou and Chris Curtis style of fight. Just butting heads, slugging in the pocket. OSP was marching forward and throwing high output, putting the pace on Kennedy, dropping him in the third round, and he deserved this win so much. This is not Kennedy Nizatruku losing to an old-ass OSP that's totally washed, doesn't have his head in the game anymore. This was Kennedy losing to a crafty, grizzled vet in OSP who actually had a fire lit under him, all right? So I was happy to see OSP show up with some serious energy tonight. Anyway, let's get on to the next one. So credit to OSP. Really good performance from him. We have Isaac Dolgarian versus Christian Rodriguez. Abomination of a decision. Okay? Isaac Dolgarian won this fight. I understand that the argument for Christian Rodriguez is the second round because he landed a couple of good strikes. A couple of flush punches. He landed a knee at one point in the clinch. That made everyone say, oh, that was a flush knee. And then we kind of waited to see if Dolgarian would get rocked, but he never really got rocked. He won the second round because there was no point in the second where Rodriguez, even though he landed a couple of good shots and stuffed a couple of takedowns, there was no point where he hurt Dolgarian. And Dolgarian, although he wasn't landing a lot of strikes, had at least four minutes of control time in that round. Let me just check um, the stats. Let's check the stats. Four minutes and 11 seconds of control time. And Dolgarian had eight strikes to 12 of Christian Rodriguez. Now, I know we can't fully rely on the stats, but they were close on stats. Dolgarian had more than four minutes of control time. He won the second round. The first round was a clear Dolgarian round. It should have been his fight. It should have been his fight. Or if you want to give round three a 10-8 to Christian Rodriguez, which I, I don't know if they did, then you also have to give round one a 10-8 to Isaac Dolgarian because they were very similar. Dolgarian was, was whooping Rodriguez's ass in round one. Maybe not landing as many shots, but he was whooping his ass. He was threatening with submissions. He was being as active as you could get and dominating basically every single position. So I think that this should have been a draw if you want to give the third round to Christian Rodriguez, the first two to Dolgarian, or it should be a Dolgarian win if you don't want to consider round three a 10-8. Okay, personally, I don't mind either of those, but you can't give this fight to Christian Rodriguez for one 10-8 round, okay? Like, I, I just don't think you can, and I don't see how you can give him the second. So, Dolgarian got the shit end of the stick, okay? I would have much rather have seen a draw, even a Dolgarian win. It is what it is. Christian Rodriguez has another weird fluky style of win. He's like the Mateus Gamrot in this division. Even though he did fairly and squarely beat Cameron Simon and what's his name? Raul Rosas Jr. 
And we can kind of say that this guy is a new fraud checker on the block because he's fraud checking everyone. Dolgarian had a lot of hype going into this as a good prospect. He does have good cardio. He does have grit. He has heart. But he's missed weight for multiple fights and had massive weight advantages over guys like Cameron Simon. I think he missed weight by like three plus pounds going into that. And this was a robbery. Even if it was supposed to be a draw, it's still a robbery because one guy doesn't deserve to lose. The other doesn't deserve to win. It should have been a draw or a win for Dolgarian. So, Rodriguez, I will say this. In the beginning of the fight, I was thinking to myself, dude, this is kind of crazy. The pace that Dolgarian's putting on this guy, I don't know if he can keep this up for three rounds. I don't know if he can keep it up because he was putting a, a gnarly pace on him just ragdolling him. You could see he was putting a lot of effort into all the movements he was doing on the ground with his wrestling. He was throwing big strikes and, and looking for finishes. And I think that he kind of emptied the gas tank a little bit too much. And I was not surprised that he was really slowing down in the third round at all, because it's almost impossible to keep that type of pace up unless you're Anthony Hernandez. Let's get on to the next one. Gerald Mirashart and Brian Barbarina. Brian Barbarina versus Gerald Mirashart. This is probably the best performance I've ever seen from Gerald Mirashart. We saw everything from him, okay? Big, ugly jabs, big, ugly low kicks. All jokes aside, even though Gerald Mirashart always looks like he's fighting in slow-mo, he was imposing his will on the front foot with jabs, good kicks as well, body kicks, leg kicks. He was sticking the jab in Barbarina's face. When Barbarina would throw on him, because we know Barbarina has some pop in his hands, Gerald Mearshart would slip out of the way of those shots, and he would come over the top with a big hook or a big overhand. So not only was his countering striking looking really good, but his offensive downhill striking looked great as well. And then the takedowns, the wrestling, the submission game. Gerald Mearshart is top four in UFC history when it comes to submissions. I'm pretty sure he just got his 11th submission. The only guys that have more submissions than him, let me just check the record books. UFC records. Let's just look at this, because I know Gerald Mearshart is really high up there, and that might surprise some of you guys. Gerald Mearshart, 10 submissions. He's tied with Nate Diaz for 10. The only guys that have more are Damian Maya with 11, Jim Miller with 12, and of course, Charles Oliveira with 16. But the fact that Gerald Mearshart has 10 submissions and is fourth all time is pretty fucking nuts, dude. We got to really start showing this guy respect as one of the most dangerous grapplers in MMA. And he's not like Paul Craig that will just kind of jump out like the Kraken and, and get some fluky moment type of submission, even though Paul Craig's not a fluke here. He's crafty. He's crafty. He's not a fluke. But at the same time, you get what I mean. Gerald Mershart goes from point A to point B to point C to point D, okay? He's a guy that'll take you down. Beautiful takedowns, perfect entries, great timing, slowed it down. It was the opposite of Isaac Dolgarian. Isaac Dolgarian was with everything in his power, everything in his might, trying to muscle around Christian Rodriguez into different positions, just trying to steamroll him. Gerald Mearshart was taking his time. There was no rush, right? He had the edge. He had the edge. There's no reason to rush it, and he gets the submission. So I think that that was... The best performance I've ever seen from Gerald Mearshart based on how clean it looked. Everything looked perfect. He was slipping, getting out of the way of all the punches that Brian Barbarina was throwing. Very crafty performance, poised performance from Gerald Mearshart. Okay, and now let's discuss Jose Aldo versus Jonathan Martinez. Okay, I love the fact that Jose Aldo's coming back. And let me just say this. Let's look at UFC 301. Let's look it up, because I actually love this card, guys. I really love this card. I know I was complaining about Pantoja and Ursic, but that was more my complaints about the flyweight division. UFC 301 in and of itself is actually a pretty good card right now. They have not updated this and put Jose Aldo on it yet. But in general, let me just say this about Aldo and Jonathan Martinez, okay? I love this fight because it's going to be competitive. Jose Aldo is one of those veterans one of those all-time greats that's actually been able to maintain his speed at an older age it's kind of funny because aldo fans will claim that he was washed when he fought volk and max a couple of times like five six years ago but now that he's fighting a guy like jonathan martinez they'll be picking him to win and they'll be saying aldo's still a beast but he was washed when he fought those guys remember yeah okay well my point is aldo is one of the best old head fighters ever as an old man he still is fast he's fast twitch and I think he can 
beat Jonathan Martinez by KO early on. Because his boxing is a lot better, Jonathan Martinez's hands ain't that great. They're not that heavy. He's not the fastest dude when it comes to his hand speed, and he doesn't have the best takedown defense. We've seen people take him down. I know Aldo doesn't wrestle that much. I think if Aldo has an approach to the fight where he's looking to get the KO on the feet, he's looking to throw his hands, he's looking to be active with the low kicks, and he's looking to mix in some takedowns, he could do well. But I will be picking Jonathan Martinez, okay? The reason I'm picking Jonathan Martinez... A part of it is because, yes, he is active and he's young and he's hungry and all that stuff. And Aldo's coming back. And I'm sure Aldo's going to have a fire lit under him and he's probably going to be inspired and all that. But at the same time, Jonathan Martinez is like 28 years old. And he's tied for the record for the most leg kick TKOs in UFC history. Like this guy, no one really talks about him in the most realistic way possible. Like people say, man, he's got great low kicks. If I were to ask most people who has the best low kicks in MMA, they'll probably say Pereira, then they'll say Jan Blahovic, and then maybe they'll think about Jonathan Martinez. Those guys are much heavier. Their kicks have more power on them. They're not coming close. Or they are sometimes coming close, at least Jan Blahovic, but they're not TKOing anyone with low kicks. Nobody. Jonathan Martinez is like the only dude that's TKOing people with low kicks right now. And we're talking like all it takes is five or six to really change the course of a fight. When you have that type of power on such an easy thing to land, such an easy weapon to land, I mean, it, it's hard not to pick that guy against the Muay Thai style Jose Aldo, who's not Mr. Footwork, switching his stance, lateral movement everywhere, who's kind of like in the phone booth a little bit. Sitting, sitting light on his front foot, fair enough, but he doesn't move around that much. And we know Aldo, even though his kicks used to be phenomenal, he doesn't throw as many anymore. And for guys like Jonathan Martinez, it doesn't even matter if you check them. All right, Adrian Yanez was attempting to check some of these kicks. Cub Swanson was trying to check some of these kicks. It doesn't fucking matter sometimes when you have shins like that. We saw the same thing with Magomed and Goliath and Jan Blahovic. It didn't matter when Magomed tried to check them. It just would hurt him even more. Right? So I honestly am going to be predicting a leg kick TKO for Jonathan Martinez. I think Aldo has the better hands. As I said, he's one of these older dudes that still has some really quick twitch ability. He's a good boxer. I think he's even won a boxing fight. I forget, was, was it against Jeremy Stevens or something like that? But either way, I just don't think it's that likely that Aldo gets the KO in the first round. He might. He might. And is he going to wrestle? Like, is he going to really push the grappling? I don't know. He's strong. He's a big dude in the bantamweight division. He might be able to take Martinez down. But I think it's most likely that Martinez will throw a ton of low kicks early on. And I just don't think people can deal with it. You're going to have to have, like, a nasty ability to KO people early. Or you're going to have to be able to take this man down. Okay? Okay. Or you're going to have to have a style that's elusive where you're moving around a lot and not like Jose Aldo just kind of sitting there super patient with the Muay Thai style right in your face. So I think it's a bad matchup for Aldo. I will be picking Jonathan Martinez. I'm sure that a lot of people are going to say congrats to Aldo and whatnot. But I love the fight nonetheless because I still think Aldo could win. It is a competitive matchup. I could see him outboxing Martinez. Um, and if he does win this fight... You guys have heard me say that I don't think Aldo is the featherweight GOAT, and I don't think there's a good argument for him being the featherweight GOAT. Obviously, beating a bantamweight does, meet, does not mean anything for his featherweight GOAT status, okay? This fight does nothing for him at featherweight. It doesn't take away, it doesn't add. Overall, though, Jose Aldo getting a win against Jonathan Martinez, a highly respected fighter amongst the hardcore fans, in a way people look at Martinez as a bit of a boogeyman. If he beats him... We might have to put him up more on the GOAT list. I personally have Aldo at around the 6 or 7 spot. I may consider putting him at number 5. I may even have to bump him up past Volkanovski. As crazy as that sounds. Because, think of it like this. Forget featherweight. Look at what he's done at bantamweight, okay? Aldo has lost to Marab, which is not a bad loss in hindsight. Marab might be the best bantamweight. He might go on to not lose for the next couple of years. It's not a bad loss. And he was also over the age of 35, okay? Or 35 in general. 
He's lost a yawn. That's basically it. I don't care what anyone says. Aldo beat Marlon Marais. That was a robbery, and that's why people were totally okay with him getting a title shot against Jan after that loss to Marvin. I'm, I'm sorry, Marlon. He beat Marlon Marais. Everyone knows it. Everyone that's watched that fight, you probably agree that it was a robbery. He's beat Cheeto Vera. He's beat Pedro Munoz. And who else has he beat? Rob Font. And now it's going to be Jonathan Martinez. That's five solid bantamweight wins against actually ranked, like, solid guys. Every single one of the fighters that I just named are better wins than any of the guys Umar Nurmagomedov, for example, has beat. Okay? So this would actually be big for Aldo's resume in general. This is the type of win that would separate him from someone like Habib forever. Because I think there's an argument that Habib and Aldo were kind of close. I know some people might not like that, but I guess it's Habib is undefeated and his ratio of wins to losses is so good. Aldo has a lot of L's, but at the same time, he has a lot of wins. I think that you could definitely make the argument that Aldo's higher than Habib, 100%. I might even have him higher. I guess the guys that I have, this is my top seven. Jones, GSP. Oh man, I might even want to put Volca number three, honestly. I might even want to put Volca number three. Mighty Mouse, let's not even get to that right now. But we guys will have Mighty Mouse in the top four. Number five, number five, it might be Aldo. I actually kind of like Aldo with the number five spot. Number six, maybe we got to go with Habib. So I don't mind Aldo being bumped up to four. Maybe Volkanovsky, you're going to have to move down or Mighty Mouse, whoever it is. Dude, I, I, the thing is, I hate talking about the GOAT conversation in a video like this because in order for me to really explain why I rank these guys where I rank them, I need a much longer amount of time for this. But either way, it's big for Aldo's resume. If he beats Jonathan Martinez, who is a respected fighter, an avoided fighter, he's a boogeyman style of fighter. But let's look at this card. Okay, Pantoja. Versus Ursic, okay, it's a joke because the flyweight division is so shit. Uh, and when I say that, I just mean like, come on, dude. When, when you have to resort to the number 10 ranked guy in the world that's had three UFC fights with absolutely no hype whatsoever, you know that division is lacking. And people are saying things like, whoa, what? So Alexander Pantoja's dominance is being punished by you? His dominance? Like, dude, he's fighting the same fucking three guys over and over and over again. And he was not dominant against Manel Cap. He was not dominant against Brandon Moreno. Literally more than 15 minutes of the fight against Brandon Moreno. He was just half guard camping and backpack camping. Okay. So no, it's not. Oh, he's cleaned out his division. Okay. Like he's fought like five guys in the UFC. Anyway. And the division is shallow. The division is shallow. How about that? He did have a dominant win over Pantoja, but Pantoja was a pipsqueak. Let's be honest. I Listen, I'm sorry. Uh, Roy Val. <laughs> He had a dominant win over Roy Val, uh, but he, you know, Roy Val's, uh, he's a bit of a pipsqueak, but Pantoja's actually a bit of a juggernaut in that division. All right. Anyway, let's look at this card. Pantoja, Steven Ursic. Okay. Paul Craig, Cal Barajo. I love the fight. It's not the best fight you could have made for Cal Barajo. I mean, come on. I'd like a bit of a step up. You got Paul Craig, whose only chance to win, only chance to win a fight is by grappling and you're putting him up against a guy that's bigger, stronger, faster, that also specializes in grappling and wrestling. Good luck for Paul Craig to take him down. He's probably going to get KO'd on the feet. I could even see Cal Barajo beating his ass on the ground too. So I would have liked to see something tougher for Cal, but whatever. Anthony Smith, Vitor Petrino. I love it. It's an Anthony Smith fight. What's there not to like? It's a dangerous opponent, All right? Anthony Smith is going to be talking a lot in the build up to this. We might get to see Vitor Petrino get a nasty KO. We might get to see an Anthony Smith legendary win. I like that. Michelle Pereira, Mac McMurdov. It's a one-sided showcase fight for Michelle Pereira, but he fought last week, so I can't really complain about him have him not having a great opponent. Mac McMurdov is light work. He's a total can in the UFC at this point. I love when people used to hype up Mac McMurdov just because of his name. Mac McMurdov. Wow. Dude, what a hardcore name. Murdov, he's got to be great. Right? And he hangs out with, like, Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, it's an easy win for Michelle Pereira, but either way. Uh, Joaquin Silva, Dracar, close. Eh, it's nothing to see there. Alessandro Costa versus Kevin Borjas. Decent fight. I like that. But here we have Joanson Brito versus Jack Shore. Okay, Joe Anderson Brito versus Jack Shore is an amazing fight. 
Joe Anderson Brito has been on a terror fast streak, terrorizing the featherweight division, blitz creaking dudes, mogging dudes, tossing them around, knocking them out, submitting people with ease. One of the most dangerous finishers in the featherweight division outside the rankings fighting Jack Shore, who's really skilled, who is going to be small compared to Joe Anderson Brito because Jack Shore, let's be honest, I, I think he should have stayed at Bantamweight and cut a little bit more weight. Like his reasoning for leaving was the weight cut was too hard, but if you looked at his physique at Bantamweight, he was not shredded at all. I think he made a bad move of moving up. All right, these guys at featherweight are, are too big for him. But it's going to be a good fight because Jack Shore is skilled and he has that bantamweight skill moving up. Okay, but either way, it's not like this is welterweight to middleweight. It's freaking bantamweight to featherweight, another great division. So I will be picking Joe Anderson to win that fight. But either way, good fight. Elvis Brenner, My Tech Odobai, the Ice Age man himself. I love this fight. I know that people want Elvis Brenner to take a step up in competition. I totally get that. But he's had three wins in the UFC. Like, he's not on some mean streak yet. This is a very tough fighter, but that's what you should want, right? You should want Elvis Brenner to be fighting tougher guys, not weaker guys and easier guys and layups, okay? I know the issue with this one is Odobai doesn't have a ranking spot and he's unproven and he only has one win in the UFC, but he had a good win in the UFC. He has some hype around his name because of that win, because of how he looks and what his name is. And if Brenner can beat him, I think he will get a guy that is in the rankings or at least right outside of it. It's exciting too, because Brenner is a prospect that people like. He's dangerous. And Odelbai is a guy that is also a prospect that people are looking forward to seeing. Gene Silva versus William Gomez. This is the epitome of a NPC versus a guy that knows how to impose his will. Gene Silva is a madman. He is a total weirdo, but very entertaining. In the cage, he has all of these flashy techniques. He reminds me of a young Michelle Pereira with the way that he fights. He's just going out there with crazy techniques, throwing everything as hard as possible. He's a little bit like Trevor Peak in that sense, but just a little bit more of a showboater. And then William Gomez is your typical six kicks around, couple of jabs here and there, clinch him up. That's basically it. Rinse and repeat every single round. It's a good fight because Gene Silva is going to force William Gomez, who does have decent technique, who does have or did have some hype to his name. At least Cyril Gaon and the whole team that Cyril Gaon has was hyping him up. He's not been delivering at all. But either way, Gene Silva is going to force him to fight. I like this card. I like this card a lot. And we also have Aldo versus Jonathan Martinez. Stylistically good fight. Aldo been able to maintain his speed at an old age. One more solid fight, maybe a heavyweight bout. Derek Lewis, Jarzinho, gone Pavlovich, even though the UFC won't make it for whatever fucking reason. One more solid fight. This will be a good card. All right. I, I, there's so many good fights on here. Maybe not the biggest when it comes to name value, but Smith versus Vitor, that's a bit of a meme fight and it's fun. Okay. Smith is a fun fighter. He actually puts on good fights. Paul Craig Calbarajo, that's a finish in the making. Michelle Pereira going to murk Mac McMurdo. Joe Anderson, Britter, Jack Shore, that's a great fight. Highly skilled, unranked bout. Great fight. Elvis Brenner, My Tech Odobai, really good fight as well. Gene Silva, William Gomez, good fight. I like it. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know what you thought of the recap. Credit to Marcin Tabora. I'm really happy for the guy. Beautiful moment. First time in history that an Apex fighter, a fat heavyweight Apex fighter, has broke out of the Apex and earned his freedom. Anyway, until next time.